Hey everyone, welcome back to another week. Tonight we're going to be talking about the guide to change, the power to change, uh, and that's all what the month of Elul, the month that we're in, is all about. So those of you who are watching us at home, please join us live and direct over at facebook.com forward slash Pinchas Taylor, and you can watch directly. Give us a like, give us a share. You know what? Even share it to your groups. That way, when you tune in, it's not only you tuning in. It's not just about you, life. You can press share, share with your groups, and you'll be spreading the message to thousands of people. And it'll be a great thing. We'll all spread Torah. It's the easiest mitzvah you can do in the world. So uh, please help us out and give us a like and a share. Uh, comment. You can ask your comments and questions below, uh, right down there. And um, we'll, we'll take it away. So, uh, sounds like fun? All right. So, tonight is Jewish Essentials, the greatest hour of the work week and the greatest place in South Florida. That is right. So, we're talking tonight, as we said, about the month of Elul. Uh, it is the 11th month of the year. Uh, excuse me, it's the 12th month of the year, right before uh, Rosh Hashanah, the new year. And it is a time of introspection. It is a time of reflection. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to give some background information on the month of Elul. But then we're going to move into how a person makes effective changes in their life and how God helps us make effective changes in our life. Sound like fun? Yeah. Sound like fun? If you, give us a like if you like it. Okay. So uh, the month of Elul is the last month of the year. And... Really, the month of Elul marks the opening for a 40-day period where we and, God, we and God have a special connection. A special, there's a special energy of return and uh, connection in this 40-day period between the beginning of the month of Elul until Yom Kippur. Now, the month of Elul, the very first day of Elul, marks the day, the reason that this 40-day period is considered a month of forgiveness and a month of mercy and an auspicious time in that regard, is because Rosh Chodesh Elul, the first day of the month of Elul, was the day that Moses was told to come back up the mountain after the Jewish people had sinned with the golden calf, and Moses broke the first set of tablets. And then Moses pleaded on behalf of the Jewish nation that God should forgive them. And God finally says, okay, I'm willing to overlook their mistake. And then God welcomes Moses up to the mountain for the second time and said, in, in preparation for giving the second set of tablets. So the first day of Elul is the day that Moses goes up the mountain. He spends 40 days and 40 nights there with God and, and getting the uh, new tablets ready. And he comes down from the mountain 40 days later on what we call today Yom Kippur. So the reason that Yom Kippur is the day of forgiveness, that the day itself atones, is because that's when everybody knew that they were forgiven, right? The second tablets were coming down. That, that connection uh, between God and the people had been reaffirmed and reestablished. So the period beginning from the time that Moses went up the mountain until the time that he comes down from the mountain, these 40 days are what are known to be a period of forgiveness and connecting. Okay? So one of the interesting things that we find in Jewish tradition is that if you take a look at the Talmud, if you take a look at the volumes of the Talmud, written in the order, uh, or excuse me, uh, put placed in the order in which they're meant to be uh, ordered, you'll find something peculiar. What you'll find is that the volume of Gittin, of divorce, is right before the volume of Kiddushin, of marriage. You think to yourself, I mean... Wouldn't, that, wouldn't it make more sense to have the marriage first? And then, like, if you need the volume of divorce, like, that, like you, know, you gotta get married in order to get divorced, right? Why does the volume of gittin, of divorce, precede the volume of marriage, of kedushin? And so there's an interesting explanation for it. And it describes the fiber 
in the connection between humanity and God. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they sinned, so it says that humanity at that point was kind of cut off. And the, the language that the verse uses in the book of Genesis is that Adam was banished, right? The garish, he was, he was severed, right? He was sent away, he was divorced, right? Humanity, to, to, for lack of a better term, was divorced from God at that point. And so this language of separation, of severance, that entered into humanity came right at the beginning, right in the Garden of Eden. 26 generations later, <clears throat> at the giving of the Torah, you have Moses going up the mountain and the Jewish people receiving the Torah. And what does it say? Right? It uses the language of Kiddushanu, that God is sanctifying us, that God is marrying us. In fact, every commandment that we do to this day, when we before we do it, what's the language we use in the in the blessing? We say Asher Kiddushanu the Mitzvosa, right? That God who has sanctified us in His commandments, sanctified us. Kiddushanu comes from the same word, right, as Kiddushin. He sanctified us. What, what's after all happening when you marry someone? You're sanctifying them. It's this exclusive relationship that you're, you guys are the only ones for each other, right? To the exclusion of all else. It's sanctified. You're lifted up. You're Kedushin. You're Mikadish. You're sanctified. You're married. Essentially, God married us at the giving of the Torah. In fact, many of the things that we do even nowadays, in the marriage ceremony of the chuppah and various um, details of the marriage ceremony are meant to be a reflection of what took place at that first marriage ceremony between God and the Jewish people. And so that was the time. First you have, in the, in the time of the Garden of Eden, where humanity is severed, and then later on, through the Jewish people accepting the Torah, humanity is then sanctified once more. And so that's why in the view, in, in, the, in the order of the Talmud, you find Gittin, divorce, before you find Kedushin. And, and the truth of the matter is, it's a message of hope. Because even if a person thinks of themselves as being cut off, as being severed, as being divorced from God, based on our deeds, you can always remember that after Kedushin, excuse me, after the severance, there can be Kedushin. There could be a reunification. There could be reconciliation. There could be marriage once again. And so that, that is why this is the language that we're talking. And this month of Elul really reflects that theme. That if a person looks back at their year and thinks to themselves, you know what, I've been divorced from God this year. I've been severed from God this year. I'm not where I want it to be spiritually this year. Don't worry. You're not severed completely. There is no severance completely. Right? Could you imagine if it was marriage and then divorce? Was that, if that's how the Talmud would phrase? And, then if you, and if you felt separated, if you felt divorced, there's no hope. The, afterwards, there's no hope. There's nothing left. But the order that we have it is even if you're severed, even if you're divorced, even if there's a separation, don't worry. There's a chance afterwards still for Kedusha. There's still a chance for reunifying. So in this month of Elul, the month that we're currently in, one of the things that we find is a sort of cosmic uh, makeup. What we mean by cosmic makeup is a cosmic repair system is that the last 12 days of the Jewish year, in the last 12 days of the month of Elul, which begins tomorrow night, is it makes a cosmic reparation for something that took place in each month of the, pro of the previous year. So the, 12, the uh, 12 days before the end of the year makes up for 12 months ago. 
11 days before the end of the year makes up for 11 months ago. And you can refine and perfect and uplift and correct all of the things from those prior months that we, that we had this whole year. So if you're really good, the next 12 days, right, you can perfect the whole year. But it is a time to make up. It is a time to sort of set things straight, to put yourself where you want to be for the upcoming year. Uh, it's a time of extra reflection. So these last 12 days that are coming up are really a time to zero in on where we want to go, what we want to do. So each of those days has cosmic impact and we should utilize them in the proper way. Now, um, the truth of the matter is that our relationship with God is kind of like a supernal marriage, as we said. And we've, we've mentioned many times that God is sort of the male, the groom aspect, God being the giver, and we on the receiving end are, are sort of like the female in the relationship. And that is the, that is the unity between God and humanity, right? It's like a marriage, it's basically a marriage. And this is why we've mentioned before, this is why we refer to God as he in the Siddur, right, in the prayer book. It's not because of chauvinism. It's not because of, of anything like that. It's because God being the giver, right, we're asking God to bestow. Think about male and female. The, the, so everything in creation works in a giver-receiver pattern. The sun gives light. The moon gives off light. But how? But by reflecting it. Right, so the sun is the giver of light. The moon is the receiver of light. Um, we, we find that with, with the two poles of a magnet, the two, the two ends of a magnet. The, the, when do they come together? You have the, the north and the south end of the magnet. That's when they come together. You put, try to put two north ends together, try to put two south ends together, they repel each other. Right? They, two, they come together because there's giving and receiving. When you put the two together, that's when there's this unity. And they say, you find this pattern throughout creation, but you also find it in uh, male and female, right? Just the physical organs of the male and female indicate that the male is the giver in the, in the union and the female is the receiver in the union. Again, this doesn't, this doesn't uh, reflect every aspect of their being. It, plenty of women are givers. You know, it, doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean that this is the essence of who you are, but the representation of male is represented by giver and female is represented by receiver. And so when we're asking God, God is neither male nor female. God is gender neutral. God doesn't have any gender. God, but when we're asking God to be giver, right, in the sitter, in the prayer book, right, we say, God, please bestow upon us life and grace and hope and all the things that we ask for. We're asking God to give us, we refer to God in male terminology. When it comes to describing God as God is manifest in the world, God's presence is uh, felt in the world, we, some, we sometimes use the word shekhinah, right? God, the godly presence, which is a feminine term. God is neither male nor female. But if we're referring to God as God the bestower, then we refer to God in the male. If we're referring to God as God is uh, sort of manifest in earth on the receiving end, and God is the, we refer to God with female language. Again, it's just, it's just an identity thing. It doesn't indicate anything change in God at all. It's our reference point. How are we addressing ourselves and interacting with God at that particular moment? That's it. And so our relationship with God is kind of like the relationship of a marriage. And so one of the things that's interesting, there was a, there was a, a couple that was celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. And somebody asked the, the husband, you know, what's the secret of your success? How, do you, how did you manage 60 years of staying together in, a, you know, a peaceful marriage? He says, well, I just, I just started using this new device called the computer. Like he was just getting familiar with the computer. He says, marriage is kind of like a computer. He says, I know how to push all of the buttons, but I don't know how it works. And he knows what to push to get what he wants and to, to, to do what he needs to do. But he doesn't, he's not sure the inner workings of how the computer works and how, how everything. And he says marriage is kind of like the same way. And the truth is, you know, our relationship with God is, is like that as well. We know how God relates to us. We know what God has created. We know what buttons to press, what he wants, right? He tells us to fill in the Shabbos candles, whatever it is. God tells us what buttons we need to press to do what we need to do. And so we can have a relationship with God without knowing the inner work of how God works. Just got to know what he wants. In any relationship, there's got to be a give and leave 
end in the relationship, right? You can't, a lot of people like to serve God on their own terms, right? I like to keep Shabbos the way I like to keep Shabbos. Not the way the Torah says, not the way that Jewish tradition says, I like to do it the way I want to. Well, and it's not really about the Torah, and it's not really about the relationship, it's about you. And, well, I want to keep kosher the way that I, right, in my own way. Okay, well, that's maybe not God's way. Have you ever thought of maybe interacting with God on his terms, right, on God's terms? And so, you know, this idea of, of interaction in, in, in that particular way, we have to think of, okay, well, what does God want? God, God gives us this whole instruction manual in the Torah, exactly what he wants, right? Eat these foods, do these things. This is what, this is what God wants from us. You know, sometimes in our relationships, you think of the husband who, you know, they're celebrating also their 25th wedding anniversary, and the husband says to his wife, I got you a, a big, and she gets excited, yeah, golden, and she gets even more excited, bowling ball. And the wife is, like, furious. Why? Because the husband got her something, right? It was, it's for her. He bought it for her. But who did he really buy it for? Bought it for him. He wanted the golden bowling ball. She doesn't care about bowling balls, but it made him happy. I bought it for you, though, but that's not what she likes. That's not the language she speaks. Right? That's not how you communicate. That's not how you interact. you got to communicate on their terms. You, the relationship is on the other person's terms. And so when we do, when we do things like say, I'm going to observe Shabbos in my own way, or I'm going to keep kosher in my own way, or I'm going to do all these things, I'm going to pray in my own way, I'm going to do all these things in my way, well, are we connecting with God? Or are we connecting with me? So the month of Elul is a time of reflection where we have to say, you know, not only my relate. Last week we spent a lot of time talking about relationships between people. When, when we're thinking about our relationship with God as well, we have to think, is this about me or is this about them? Or excuse me, when it comes to God, is this about me or is this about God, what God wants from us? Because a relationship is not just doing what I want in the way that I feel, and you, you know, you'll accept, you need to just accept how I do things, right? It's about relating to the person on their terms and what they're interested in and what they want. Getting your wife the golden bowling ball, she'll tell you where to stick that golden bowling ball. So in the month of Elul, one of the Kabbalistic ideas of the month of Elul is that uh, there is a verse, there are many verses, but there's one verse in particular that is emphasized as to the meaning of the month of El. And there's a verse that says, Ani le dodi vidodi li, right? I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. You find this sometimes on wedding bands, you find this sometimes on uh, art that represents marriage, right? I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. Beautiful pasuk, beautiful verse. And the, if you look at the beginning letters of each of those words, ani lidodi vidodi li, right, the beginning, it's an acronym for the word Elul. So the month of Elul is a time where we're reminded of ani lidodi, I am to my beloved, to God, vidodi li, and God is to me. And it's a time, notice that first comes the ani lidodi, right, I am to my beloved. But it doesn't start from God being to us, it's I am to him. And the idea is that we need to make the initiative. And it's this time of year that we need to make the initiative in cultivating our relationship with God. It's interesting, in that, in that same verse, ani le jodi vijodi li, each of those four words end with the letter yud. So in numeric values, uh, yud plus yud plus yud plus yud, It'd be 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 40. That hints at the 40 days between the beginning of the month of Elul and Yom Kippur. That this is a special opportunity to connect with God in a unique way in this time of forgiveness where we can initiate our own change, where we can initiate our own self-improvement. And we all have areas within us that we need to improve and that we can focus in on. So this intense love between God, and in particular the Jewish people, comes to the surface during Elul. The name of the month of Elul, like many of the uh, Jewish months, were named, were, were named uh, in the Babylonian exile, and it originates from the Akkadian word meaning harvest. 
There is another uh, thought as to another possible uh, source for the word Elul, and it comes from the Aramaic word, which means to search, because the month of Elul is a time of searching, where we're looking within, how can I make improvements for the upcoming year? How can I better myself? How can I better the world? How can I better my relationships? It's a time of introspection, of searching. So it's time to examine our relationship with God. And the word Elul, the numeric value, Aleph plus Lamed plus Zav plus Lamed, equals 67, which is the same numeric value as the word Bina, understanding. It's a month of understanding. It's a month where we are um, getting close to God through the means of understanding. And the truth is, the in interesting that the word Bina itself is composed of two words, Ben, Yud, with a He, which means the a child of God. And we're back. We're talking about the power to change, and we've been, we've been talking about the month of Elul, the last of the Jewish months, which is a time of introspection, a time of thinking about how my previous year went and how I want my next year to go. And we're talking about how is it that we can change. Okay, so here we go. So uh, we were talking about Elul as a time of understanding. Elul has the numeric value of 67 which is also the numeric value of the word Bina, understanding. And the word Bina itself can be broken up into two words, Ben Yud with a He, right, a child of God. And it's through be being a child of God, it's because we're a child of God that we're blessed with understanding and insight into our mission during this particular month. Okay, so this, this month of Elul has has no holidays in it, but the full month itself has this sort of holiday energy uh, that, we are, that we are culminating on. In fact, the Hasidic masters describe the month of Elul as a time where the king is in the field, where the king, God, is more accessible than God is throughout other times in the year. Now, what does that mean practically? If you think about it, you know, we're in 2019, which means that we're already sort of in election season. There's a lot of candidates that are all going around, making the rounds around the country. And this happens every four years. There's always candidates, you know, rolling around the country. And when they roll around the country, they, they dress in their casual clothes. They put on their polo shirts. They, they're talking to uh, Joe the plumber, and they're talking to just random people, people in town halls and old age homes and wherever they... They go all over the place. The commoners. They're very accessible, very easy to talk to. Once they're elected president, doesn't matter who they are, right, they're very difficult to access. That's just the nature of the job. Right? You gotta go through the Secret Service, and you have a special invitation, or whatever. It's not just, you know, show up, right? And that's just gonna talk to anybody about anything at any time. And so that is sort of the that is sort of the theme of the month of Elul, the king is in the field, means that God is more accessible. What does it mean God is more accessible? God is open to us 24-7, 365 days a year. God being more accessible means that our likelihood of wanting to connect, our likelihood of wanting to uh, embark on the inspiration would happen during this time period. Right? It's a special time of connectivity, a special time of accessibility, and we have to use it in the best way that we can. Okay, so um, now in this time period, in the month of Elul in particular, where we're thinking about change and how to be our best, one of the, th one of the areas that we really have to do is not look outward how to change the world. We have to look inward how to change ourselves. And there's an interesting idea that comes along with the concept of changing yourself. There is a verse in last week's Torah portion, the, the, the beginning verse in last week's Torah portion, that really tells us and gives us insight as to how to change properly. So the verse says, He said Milchama Vecha, right? When you go out to war against your enemies, 
Hashem, your God, will deliver them into your hands and you'll capture the captive. Okay, when you go out to war against your enemies, Hashem will deliver them into your hands. Now, the Torah is relevant all the time. The Torah is eternally relevant. Now, the Jewish people, though, aren't always fighting wars. The Jewish people as a nation always aren't fighting wars. Even 2,000 years ago, when we were you know, a full nation and everything, with, with, with all the biblical status, of, but we weren't always fighting wars. The past 2,000 years, the Jewish nation hasn't been fighting wars. So where's the eternal relevance in going out to war against your enemy that God is going to deliver the enemy into your hand? So the eternal relevance comes along when we recognize that the enemy that's being discussed over here and in general is not only the enemy on the outside. When the nation goes to war outside with other nations, but more importantly, the eternal relevance is the enemy within. And there is an enemy within. Life is one big war, like this one big battle where there's a lot of conflict going on inside between a good impulse and a not good impulse, right? We all have a Yetzir Hara. We all have an evil inclination. And this life is a war between the good inclination within you and the evil inclination within you. In Israel, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, has a ceremony regularly by the Kotel, by the Western Wall. When all the new soldiers are being sworn in in front of their parents, they're wearing their brand new uniforms for the first time. They're all given a Bible and a weapon. The truth of the matter is that birth into this world is actually that exact same ceremony. The new soldier's uniform that your soul is donning is a body. The Bible that you're being handed is the wisdom of the Torah. And the weapon that you're being given is the tools that God is giving you against the evil inclination within to, in order to fight the battle, in order to win the battle, in order to be victorious in the war. The Ramchal, the famed Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, a great sage in the past few hundred years, said that in truth, a person is put into the middle of a raging war. That's what being born is. You're being put into war. A war that you're going to be fighting probably your entire life inside. Life's a battle. Life's a war. So when we look inside, when we're fighting a war, you got to know the enemy. Who is your enemy? Right? Like George W. Bush says, you're either with us or you're against us. Right? you got to know who is the enemy. Who is with you and who is against you. It works the same way inside. Got to know who's your enemy. What's the enemy look like in you? And so the inner enemy, the enemy within all of us, right? Where's your struggles? Do you struggle with addiction? Do you struggle with depression? Do you struggle with laziness? Do you start struggle with negativity? Do you struggle with anger, with resentments, with anxieties, with fears? Where's the enemy within in you? We have to be able to point them out. Say, this is where my struggle is. But can't go to war if you don't know who's the enemy. Can't just start firing off, right? You don't know who you're firing at. Maybe it's the good guy. So you got to know who your enemy is inside in order to fight against him. So not only do you have to know who the enemy is, like what outfit they're wearing, but you have to know how they work. Because if you know who they are, but you don't know how they work, you won't know how to combat them. Right? You can know who's the enemy, but there could be different styles of enemy. So, like, in other words, the way in which you fight the Nazis may be different than the way that you fight Al-Qaeda. Because it's a whole different mentality. It's a whole different ideology. And so, yes, you might use the same weapons, but you got to combat the enemy, not only knowing who the enemy is, but you got to do it in the style that that enemy, that's going to be effective for that enemy. One of, the, one of the problems that the Americans had when fighting the Japanese was fighting with kamikaze pilots. 
because kamikaze pilots didn't mind dying. Usually in a war, you know, both sides while trying to preserve their life, the kamikaze pilots didn't care. So it was, it became different. It became a whole different thing because they would fight in a whole different way. It affected the whole style in which they were fighting because they didn't care about dying. And in some times, with some enemies, they don't. Others do. Others are motivated by different things. There's a code within each enemy. So you got to know who the enemy is, and you got to know how that enemy works. How does he get in there? So thankfully, the Maharal of Prague has told us the code, the secret code of the Eitzer Hara, the secret code of the evil inclination, of the enemy within. In other words, all of our enemies within, whether it's anxiety or addiction or laziness or uh, fears or whatever it is, negativity, whatever it is, it stems from one single place, says the Maral. There's one code as to how this, how the Eight Sahara works. Now, I'm going to say the word in a moment. I want to keep you in suspense. But after we take that, then depending on who you are, what your nature is, what your genetic makeup is, and your nurture, what type of environment you grew up in and live in and everything like that, that will express how this code expresses itself. But ultimately, the root of all of these Yetzirharas, of all of these evil inclinations, these enemies within, the root of all of them is in one word, lack. L-A-C-K, lack. The Yetzir Hara, the enemy within, tells you, you don't have what you need. You don't have what you need. And then again, it manifests itself in a variety of ways. You don't have what you need, so take this drug. You don't have what you need, so you should be anxious. You don't have what you need, so you should be negative. And then we look at other, we look at aspects of our life and the, the areas that we struggle in are outgrowths of, I don't have what I need. I don't have the job that I want. Of course, so of course I'm blank. Of course I'm lazy there. Or of course I'm negative about it. Or of course I'm, uh, whatever, you fill in the blank. Or I have the job I, I need, but I don't like my boss. Or I have, I like my, whatever it is, in every area of life and in every expression of the enemy within, all of it is rooted in you don't have what you need. The enemy within tells you you don't have what you need and this is, this is how it's going to express itself. Whether it's addiction, whether it's negligence, uh, excuse me, negativity, whether it is depression, whether it's laziness, anxiety, fears, you pick it, it's rooted in lack. You don't have what you need. The feeling, the, 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 the prodding, you don't have what you need. You got to fill something. You got, there's something you need to fill. And so God tells us, though, that if you go to war against your enemy, God will deliver the enemy into your hands. If you identify the enemy and you know how the enemy works and you say, I want to change, I want to defeat this enemy, God will help you defeat that enemy. So if a person is in the addiction community, they got to say, okay, I need recovery. I need to go to meetings. I got to take action. I got to put forth the effort and God will help them to do that. If a person has anxieties, fears, lazy, whatever it is. Maybe they need a therapist. That's okay. Or maybe other, maybe there's other exploration. Maybe there's other ways to, to cope with those particular struggles. We all have struggles and we all, we all have an enemy within and we all need to go to war with the enemy within. And when we do, when we put forth the effort, God will help deliver that enemy into our hands. In fact, the Talmud says, the Gemara and Yuma says that a person who comes to purify themselves in this world is granted help from on high. Anyone who wants to make themselves better, God will help them do it. But you got to want it. You got to do something about it. So, 
We all have to go to war against the enemy. In fact, that's the whole purpose that we're here for. Our whole purpose here on planet Earth is going to war with the enemy. It's to, fight, it's to make ourselves better by going to war with this guy and defeating him. It's the whole purpose that we're here. What happens if a person doesn't go to war with the enemy? And all of those things, all of those expressions, the, the enemy within is just left to sit there. We let all those, we let the addictions, we let the resentments, we let the anxieties, we let the laziness, we let the negativity, we let the fears, we, we let it just sit inside us. Well, the problem is, the big problem, is that begins to affect the way that we interact with and live in the world. It begins to affect our whole world outlook. Think about it like this. There's a great story. There, was, there were these two kids, they were trying to play a joke on their grandfather. And so the grandfather fell asleep on the couch and it was time for the grandfather to wake up. And so rather than just shaking him, they went to the refrigerator and they got themselves a little bit of cheese that was beginning to rot. And so they went, to the, they went to the grandfather and they stuck this, you know, little bit of cheese by his nose and they put it a little too close to his nose and a little bit of the curdled cheese went into his nostrils. And so when that happened, he like, he, he started waking up and the kids ran away and he's looking around and he smells and he says, ugh, this living room stinks. And then he walks, he goes into his bedroom, smells, he says, ugh bedroom stinks. And he goes into the dining room, smells. Ugh, his dining room stinks. And he goes outside, smells, and he says, the whole world stinks. And this is exactly how it works when we have something stinky inside of us. When there's something sticky, uh, stinky stuck inside of us, we start looking at the whole world like the whole world stinks. Maybe it's just something that's not refined in you, right? Before you see the whole world sinks, let's make sure we don't have anything stuck, in us, stuck inside of us that we need to be going to war with, that we haven't gone to war with. So the way that we go to war with the evil inclination is by feeding those aspects of ourselves, our strengths, our weaponry, our, our capabilities, our... our, uh, our artillery against the enemy, right, by feeding our positive aspects and by cutting off the negative, by using them completely against the negative. There's a great story, actually, of, uh, of a grandfather Indian chief. And the grandfather Indian chief was talking to his young, brave grandson. And the grandfather, the Indian chief, says to the brave, says, within you there are two warring wolves. One is a good wolf, one is a bad wolf. The good wolf that's inside of you are all of the good things in life. Happiness, purposefulness, meaning. The negative wolf, the bad wolf, is negativity, is fear, anxiety, all of the bad things in life. And there's a constant war inside of you between these wolves to see who's going to be the dominant one, who's going to be in charge of you? And so the grandson is looking at his grandfather and says, well, who wins? Who wins? Which wolf? And the grandfather looks back and says, whichever one you feed. Whichever one you feed. You want to feed your negativity? You want to feed your anxieties? That's the one that's going to win. But you feed the other good stuff, the, the, the bad wolf, he starves to death. Okay, so... A lot of people, when hearing this type of thing, they think to themselves, you know, in my life, I have too big a burden. The boulder is, is just too much on my shoulders. I cannot lift this, this weight. All of the, the enemy within has just has got me so barred down. I can't carry the burden of it. So there's a great story in the Talmud that talks about... Uh, it's Rabbi, Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, who lived in the Second Temple era. And Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa saw that there were other people that were giving many gifts to the Temple. Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa saw all these nice gifts, and he didn't have the means to give the same type of gift. And he was concerned. He really wanted to give a gift, but he didn't have 
those sort of means. And so he spent, he went out into the Middle Eastern desert and found a big bowl, a big rock that he thought if he polishes it and he chisels it and he makes it look really nice, somehow, some way, maybe it can be used in the, in the temple structure. And so he carves it and he polishes, makes it really nice. And he's ready to bring it back to Jerusalem and he tries to lift up the rock, the boulder. He can't do it. It's too heavy. So God sends a slew of angels that are dressed like laborers and they all grab hands uh, underneath this big boulder and they ask Rabbi Hanina ben Zosa to put his hand on the rock as well. And they lift up the boulder and it comes right off the ground and instantaneously they're transported to Jerusalem. That's a great story, right? God sent angels to help. So the question is, if God is sending angels anyway, certainly the angels can lift up the boulder. Why do they ask Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, this elderly Jew, to put his hand on the rock as well? And the answer is that God will send angels, but we've got to put forth our hand as well. When we put our hand, when we want to lift the boulder that is, that is crushing us in our life, when we want to get that heavy weight off our shoulders, God will help us. God will send the angels. God will move us directly and immediately to Jerusalem. But we got to put our hand on it. we got to make the effort. we got to start it off. But if we start it off, if we go to war against the enemy, God will deliver the enemy into our hands conclude with uh, it's an interesting thought brought about by Rav Dessler. Rav Dessler was a great scholar, passed away uh, mid-20th century. And Rav Dessler says something interesting. He talks about the Eitzar Hara as it exists today, right? The evil inclination as it is in our world in 2019. Well, back then, but even more so in 2019. says our challenges that we have and the accessibility to all the things of the Eitzar Hara are greater now than they've ever been in the past. In fact, if previous generations would see what we are up against, they would be baffled. How could they possibly deal with that? Because the accessibility to all of the things of the Eitzar Hara are easier to get than ever before. Person wants drugs, easy access. Person wants immorality, easy access. Person wants access to anything of the Yetzir Hara, you have pretty easy access to it. So the Yetzir Hara today is way stronger, much stronger than it's ever been. And what he, he compares it to a candle that before it goes extinguished, before, right before the candle extinguishes, it has a spurt of flame. It like gets real big, like blows up. And a combatant works the same way. A combatant also releases their energy right when they feel they're about to be vanquished, right? They, let, they throw whatever they can at you, trying to hurl whatever they can because they know they're about to be defeated, but they want to try whatever is possible just to, to get it, to, 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 to try to do it. I, I say it's like, like in football. You know, you're all the way down. It's, there's like five seconds left right on the clock, and you're all the way down at the other end of the field. You, you, there's no way you can win unless you get a touchdown in the next five seconds. And so the, the quarterback says, all right, the play is Hail Moses. And he says, down set hike, and just go along. Everyone just run to the, <laughs> run to the touchdown. And anyone who's even close to open, he just throws it, just hoping maybe something, and he tries this. And that's exactly how the enemy works right before he's about to be vanquished. When he knows that his time is limited, when the enemy knows that he's about to be defeated, they just start throwing whatever they can at you to try to make some sort of damage. Maybe something will work. Maybe something will overcome. They get scared. And so the Yetzir Hara, the evil in the world and the evil within, knows that its days are limited. Mashiach is coming. Its days are limited, and as we approach that time, as we approach that time, it will throw at us everything it possibly can, anything, maybe, something, whatever it is. 
But because the Yetzir Hara is stronger in our days, God, in an even fashion, provides us with help that corresponds with that challenge. You know the cliche, God never gives a person a challenge they can't handle. Well, that's true. That is 100% true. We say it as a cliche because everybody says it. But we have to believe that. That is true. There is no boulder. There is nothing on your shoulders that is insurmountable to you. There is nothing that is put on your plate that you can't handle. If you were given that on your plate, if that's what comes on your shoulders, you have the ability to, to overcome it. You have the ability to lift that burden. And God will send angels to help you do it. So as we continue in the month of Elul, as we continue working our way towards Rosh Hashanah, let's remember the power to change is within us. Is the desire to change within us. Because the power is, we got to have the desire. But if we have the desire, and we start going to war against our enemy, guess what happens? God will deliver the enemy into our hands. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening, and God willing, we see all of you next week. Don't forget to give us a like and give us a share. Follow us directly on our page at facebook.com forward slash Pinchas Taylor, and I look forward to learning with all of you next week as well. Have a great evening. Thank you.